Hello, everyone, and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us for today's press briefing here at the International Monetary Fund, where we will be briefing on a new uh, staff paper, working paper, and it's titled A Global Strategy to Manage the Long-Term Risks of COVID-19. This is actually a joint uh, working paper. It's been done in collaboration with the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, that's the acronym CIPI, the Global Fund and Welcome Trust. And at today's briefing, we are very pleased to be joined by the IMF's first Deputy Managing Director, Gita Gopinath, and the head of the IMF's Global Health and Pandemic Response Task Force, Rushir Agarwal. Along with Gita and Rushir, we have the principles from those co-authoring global organizations that I mentioned. We have Sir Jeremy Farrar, who is Director of Wellcome Trust. And we have Dr. Richard Hatchett, who is the CEO of CP. And Peter Sands, Executive Director of the Global Fund. We'll hear from each of our speakers, and then we'll turn to your questions. I want to begin with our first Deputy Managing Director, Gita. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you all for joining us today to discuss a global strategy to manage the risks of COVID-19. Now, one that reflects a changing reality where COVID-19 may be with us for a long time to come. Last year, when we wrote the pandemic plan, it was expected that high enough levels of vaccination were the key to ending the pandemic. However, with a fast evolving virus, it is now clear that vaccines, while highly beneficial, are by themselves not a silver bullet, and COVID-19 is likely to be with us for the long term. Now, given the many possible scenarios for the evolution of COVID-19, from some benign to some very severe scenarios, and given the limited resource constraints that resources countries have, we need a new strategy. The paper lays out what a new strategy might look like. At its core, it's about providing countries with a more comprehensive COVID-19 toolkit for fighting the pandemic that includes vaccines, tests, treatments, but also requires R&D and genomic surveillance and bolstering the resilience of health systems. So countries with limited resources are in a better position to tackle both COVID-19 and other deadly diseases in a sustainable and effective way. You may ask why we at the IMF so focused on this. It's simple, because health security is economic security. As recently as our January World Economic Out Outlook update, we'd estimated the cumulative losses from the pandemic to reach around $13.8 trillion. This is going through 2024. The international community should recognize that its pandemic financing addresses a systemic risk to the global economy. Thus, we are calling for additional funding to fight pandemics and to strengthen health systems. This will require about $15 billion in grants this year and $10 billion annually after that. Together with our partners on the Multilateral Leaders Task Force and with the ACT Accelerator, the IMF stands ready to help countries meet the challenges of the pandemic and their financing needs, including through a resilience and sustainability trust. The cost of inaction for all of us is very high, and we need to act now. With this, let me hand it over to Jeremy. Jeremy? Well, thanks very much, uh, Gita. Let me just uh, introduce Jeremy by uh, placing him in the crossfires with a question. Uh, Jeremy, the paper emphasizes that COVID-19 is with us for the long term. How do you see this pandemic evolving and why call for greater global uh, cooperation now? Thanks, Jerry, and, and um, pay tribute to my co-authors, in particular the International Monetary Fund for picking this up, but also uh, from CEPI and the Global Fund. Um, three points. Um, We've had multiple warnings over many, many years of an impending pandemic, um, and truly we failed to act. The, the second is that this one ain't over. 
Uh, the pandemic still continues to reverberate. I'm sitting here in Washington, but yesterday I was in London. In London at the moment, one in 12 people are infected in a country with incredible vaccine uptake and vaccination. We have many parts of the world without access to vaccines, and we have many parts of the world where transmission remains very, very high. That throws up the possibility of new variants that will escape our current vaccination and our current immunity. So if we did not take the previous warning seriously, let us make sure that we take these warnings seriously. And whilst the political and the societal desire amongst all of us, we're fed up with this pandemic, we want to move on. But the truth is, it is not over. Um, and the actions that we take now, the reforms that we put in place, the financial support we give, will enable the pandemic in its acute phase to come to an end quicker and allow all of societies, all of education, all of our economies to get back on track faster. And lastly, this will not be the last pandemic. So I'm afraid unless we take the warning seriously, unless we act now, and unless we make sure we give all of our countries the true toolkits to respond, whether that be vaccination, social measures, diagnostics, treatment, and et cetera, then I'm afraid this pandemic will continue to reverberate and disrupt the whole of societies for many, many years to come. So I applaud what the IMF has done, providing the leadership in order to bring us together. And I applaud uh, what my colleagues Richard and Peter on the CEPI and Global Fund did. But now is the time to act uh, before the pandemic rushes away from us again. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Jeremy Farrar, of course, is uh, director of the Wellcome Trust, as I mentioned at the outset. Let me turn to uh, Dr. Richard Hatchett. And of course, Richard is the CEO of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. Richard, if I could introduce you by asking you, uh, looking at some of the global policy actions, how should the world prioritize research and development investments to upgrade its toolkit to handle the new COVID variants, uh, novel coronaviruses and other threats? Great. Thank, thank you, Jerry. Um, and I, I, like, like Jeremy, I want to I pay tribute to our colleagues at IMF and, 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 and to my co-authors, Jeremy and Peter, for putting, putting uh, this paper together. I think it, it offers us an important opportunity to reflect on living with COVID. Um, I just want to pick up where, where, where Jeremy left off. Um, Omicron has revealed, um, again, that the virus continues to evolve. We're very fortunate at this point that the disease does appear to be milder and in many countries with high rates of vaccination um, that they are managing their way through uh, the epidemics that have resulted. But it, it speaks to the potential of the virus to continue to evolve and, and certainly we have no way of predicting whether we may see variants in the future that are as infectious or more infectious than Omicron but that manage to evade the immune system more effectively and, and evade our current vaccines, potentially uh, creating the opportunity for new pandemics to emerge from within the, the subsiding current pandemic. I think we face a triple challenge at the moment. We need to continue to stay ahead of, of the virus, and that means building on the vaccines that we have, developing better vaccines that are more broadly effective, uh, potentially even that could protect against not only COVID and its future variants, but against other coronaviruses, that would be, be the ideal. But we also have to reconfigure our global system for production and distribution um, so that we can more effectively deliver vaccine products to the world. And we need to do that in a way, as, as, as I think Peter will talk about, that does not draw critical funding and attention away from other critical global health needs. Um, for COVID-19, I think we need to continue to focus on investing in, in research and development for new, better, more effective, more durable vaccines. Um, and we need, in the longer term, to build capabilities in, in which future viral pathogens, not just COVID, not just coronaviruses, but other uh, potential viral threats no longer pose an existential threat to our way of life. We will do that by investing in, in platforms and capabilities that have already been validated. They will be the foundation for 
future global health security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, just before turning to uh, questions from journalists, let me turn to Peter Sands, who, of course, is executive director of the Global Fund. Peter, how can investing in health systems and community networks help defeat COVID and prepare for future pandemics we know will come? Many thanks, Jerry. And um, look, this is a very august panel to be part of. You have two renowned uh, economists in Gita and Lucia, and you have two renowned scientists in Jeremy and Richard, and then you have me. <laughs> the paper makes the argument that we need to recognize and shift our strategy on the basis that COVID is here for the long term and that there are huge uncertainties around what kind of variants we'll face and there's a spectrum of potential outcomes. Um, the implications of those are quite profound. First, the fact that it's a long-term fight means that we need to integrate our activities in response to COVID-19 with other health priorities. And that, as you mentioned, means that we have to think in terms of the systems, including community systems, that can help us fight not just COVID-19, but other infectious diseases, such as the ones the Global Fund's mission is about, HIV, TB, and malaria, and prepare to prevent and respond to future pathogens. So that involves both investment in systems that are deliberately designed to be able to counter multiple different types of pathogen, but it also involves some trade-offs that will need to be made at a country level, reflecting the different kinds of disease burden and threat that different communities face. <clears throat> In many of the poorest countries of the world, it is diseases like malaria or TB that are actually killing more of their people than COVID-19, which is not to argue for underinvesting in COVID-19, but to recognize that we need to take a very integrated, holistic approach as we proceed against this disease. The, the fact that we face a wide spectrum of scenarios as to how COVID-19 will evolve has two very practical implications. One is that there's a significant premium to investments that deliver benefits across those scenarios. And this is exactly where the priority for investing in systems for health makes sense because they deliver benefits regardless of whether you have a mild scenario for how COVID unfolds or even more if you have a severe scenario and they also deliver benefits against other diseases. And it also leads to a premium to investments that allow us to detect early how the pandemic is evolving. And hence the huge importance of testing all the way through from RDT at a community level, to rapid diagnostic tests, to genomic um, sequencing. The, we have seen with Omicron how quickly a new variant can, can run across the world in a matter of weeks. So you don't actually have much time when a new variant occurs. But the earlier you can detect it, the earlier we can start thinking about how to shift strategy or what other medical countermeasures may be needed. Underpinning all of this is the fact that when it comes down to it, the systems, the infrastructure, the human resources that you use to fight a new disease are very much the same as those you're using to fight existing diseases. It's the same supply chains, laboratory networks, primary healthcare facilities, community health workers, and so on. And collectively, we need to get smarter at maximizing the synergies between building resources to fight diseases such as HIV, TB, and malaria, the new threat of COVID-19, and to enable countries to prevent, detect, and respond to future threats. And that's where the investment in systems for health, including community systems, is so vital. 
Back to you. Thanks very much, Peter. Thanks to you all. Let's turn to uh, questions from our colleagues in the media. And let me ask you to, if you will, turn on your camera and raise your hand. We'll take as many uh, questions as we can from you. And uh, I, I see Ashley Furlong has already switched on. Thank you, Ashley, and raised your hand. So you get to go first. Come on in. Ashley Furlong with Politico. Thanks so much. Um, my question's about long COVID. You know, we're talking about the, the, the unknowns about the future of the pandemic and, um, you know, uh, how we recover from the pandemic. And I'm wondering how uh, long COVID fits into that picture as we, you know, likely going to be having millions, even millions more people with living with long COVID. You know, how does that affect um, the economic recovery and sort of health systems recoveries um, as they cope with sort of the backlog of, of cases uh, as we sort of emerge from a pandemic scenario? Thanks very much, Ashley. Uh, if, if your question is directed to a particular panelist, uh, do, uh, do let us know. Given the economic uh, impact of that one, I'm going to throw it first to, to Gita and perhaps Rushir, and then others may wish to join in. Gita. Well, thanks, Jerry. I, th I think actually we should start with uh, either Jeremy or Richard on what long COVID, uh, what the impact is of long COVID in terms of health consequences, uh, which is what the question was about. But since you've come to me, I will just make a point uh, on the economic costs of this uh, particular pandemic that hasn't ended yet, uh, as several of the co-authors have made uh, made that point clearly. Uh, in January, based on our projections for global economic activity, our estimate at that time was that the pandemic was going to cost around $13.8 trillion for the global economy cumulatively over the period of 2020 to 2024. So we're talking about trillion, trillions of dollars in costs. Uh, we also are living in a time and world where inflation is very high in many countries. We have supply chain disruptions that continue. Uh, and we know that the, that the pandemic is one of the factors that is contributing to these disruptions in the world. So it's economically uh, incredibly important and which is why we need to uh, address it uh, now. Thanks, Gita. Jeremy. Yeah, Ashley, thanks for your question. Uh, it's a hugely important question. Um, we, we should just remind ourselves we're two and a bit years into this pandemic, and anybody that tells you that they know everything about this infection and its long-term consequences is, is to be treated with a pinch of salt. Um, we don't yet know the consequences of long COVID. Um, uh, we don't yet know, as has been reported in many reports over the last just over the last month, that, that it seems that there are impacts on many parts of, uh, of the body, um, including on the brain, including on uh, susceptibility to things like diabetes. If you think of the number of people infected around the world, you would only have to have a small percentage of those impacted for the long term to have a massive health and economic consequence. We do know um, that vaccines help prevent some of the impact of long COVID, so it makes another argument to me for vaccination. It also makes an argument for early treatment, which goes to Peter's point about early testing and treatment. But we need studies around the world to try and document what the long-term health consequences and broader societal consequences are of long COVID, and those are being forgotten about. As the political expediency says, let's move on from this. Let's deal with it like we deal with flu. Let's deal with it as living with COVID. Things like long COVID are being forgotten. And I would counsel everybody to not think that the longer term consequences of mass infection across the world, probably five, six billion people will ultimately be infected by this infection. And therefore, there will be longer term consequences that we need to be aware of let alone on children, sorry. We, children are often forgotten in this pandemic. We don't know the long-term consequences of infection on their children's development, on their education, and their long-term life consequences. So these are absolutely critical in questions. And humility in the face of a brand new human infection is absolutely critical, which is why this IMF paper is so important, because it lays out different scenarios that may be forgotten in otherwise political discussions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I'm wondering if any other uh, panelist wants to come in on this particular question. 
Rush, uh, Rushi, uh, Richard, yes? Uh, no, go ahead, Rushir, please, go ahead. Uh, perhaps just to build on what uh, both Keith and Jeremy have said, the, one of the consequences also on the social side is on the human capital. So we've looked at, for example, school closures around the world, and there, there are deep inequalities in terms of how the long-term impact of COVID will stay with us. We'll, a lot of future generations are going to carry that impact for decades from now. And, and in developing countries, those school closures have been about uh, twice as long as in developed countries. And we know the school-age children, there are about twice as many school-age children in developing countries than in advanced countries. So when you just take those cumulative effects, that's quadruple the impact of, of school closures. What we just don't know yet is how that impact in these two years, it, how we are going to carry that for for decades into the future. So a lot more attention is needed to that and a lot more studies to understand uh, the size of the impact and how to remedy those impacts. Thank you. Thank you, Rushir. Richard, did you wish to come in? Uh, yes, thanks, Jerry. Just, just to make a, a general comment, and it does kind of build on all, all of the preceding comments, this cumulative burden of morbidity, mortality, uh, the social impacts that Rushir was mentioning from the prolonged school closures will unfold over time. And it is an easy cost to neglect or, or, or to assimilate without fully appreciating in, in the way that Jeremy described. I, it, I think it illustrates the dangers of new pathogens, and particularly when you multiply, the, any, any fraction multiplied by billions ends up in, with a very large and frightening number. Um, and I think it, it, it speaks to the importance, if we have the capability, and I would argue we have the technical means um, to dramatically reduce ep future epidemic and pandemic risk, not only from, from COVID, as we were mentioning, but from other pathogens. Those are investments which are tiny compared to the, the cumulative cost of a global experience of, an, of a new disease, and, and certainly are, are worth making and investing in now. Thank you very much, Richard. Let's go back to uh, our colleagues online. And I see Naomi uh, Grimley of the BBC. Naomi, would you like to come in? Yes, thanks very much for doing this. It's very useful. Um, could I ask the panel what China in particular needs to, to do to get out of zero COVID quandary? Jeremy, take the first crack, please. Naomi, thank, thanks very much. Um, Richard, I'm sure, and Rashir and would, ha would have some other comments. Firstly, I, I would give uh, credit to all countries that have, been, that have so far managed to control their epidemics in their countries with minimal uh, loss to life and impact on their broader health systems. And I, you know, China's done that, New Zealand's done that, and there are other countries that we could... I think, uh, learn from and take great credit to. But their exit from this phase of the pandemic is a very complex one. Um, and China in particular is something I've talked about regularly. Uh, it is home to, what, 17% of the world's population, 1.4 billion people. Um, they, in China, have managed to control the pandemic to the point that there is no natural immunity, effectively. They've had no real waves of this epidemic yet. The numbers have been tiny. The vaccines that China has access to and is using, um, I would argue, are perhaps not quite as effective as some of the vaccines available in other parts of the world. And China has struggled, as it's uh, publicly said, with ensuring vaccination amongst their most vulnerable populations, people particularly over the ages of 70. So I think China has a very complex and difficult path out of this pandemic. What I hope that they do, um, and in discussions with colleagues in China, is to use the current program of trying to reduce transmission whilst having a very active and inclusive ability to get vaccines out to everybody uh, the whole population, but particularly those who are most vulnerable. If they can buy time, like New Zealand did, like Australia did, uh, to get their vaccine program out to as many people as possible, including boosting doses, I think that gives them the best strategy of trying to exit from the pandemic. But it will not be easy. 
it will not be without real problems. Uh, and I think uh, as a world, and a lesson of the last two years, we should come together and do everything we can to uh, work together as a world to make vaccines the, and treatments available globally, including within China, where that is possible and appropriate. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm just looking at other uh, colleagues on the panel. Anyone else looking to come in on this one? Okay, uh, back to uh, our, our journalist friends online. Uh, I see Andrea there of Reuters. Andrea Shalal, good, good to see you. Andrea, come on in. Good morning. Hey, thanks so much for doing this. It's really helpful. Um, I wanted to ask Gita and, and Rashir, if possible, um, to weigh in on this estimate that it's going to be $13.8 trillion is the cost. I know, I know that that was the previous estimate. Are you expecting to revise that estimate up um, when you release the new WIO in April? Uh, later this month, uh, given the kind of recurring outbreaks that have happened, but also the lockdown in China. And then I wanted to ask, um, you know, this is this amount of money that is being asked for the grants is not dissimilar to the amount that was being asked for before. And that was hard to raise. Are you are you reaching out separately to, you know, institutions like the G7? Um, um, to ensure that this funding actually becomes available? I mean, you know, particularly given the war, um, obviously funding uh, availability is limited. And we saw recently that in Afghanistan, um, you know, the, the donors conference was only able to raise half of the amount of money. So given all of the conflicting demands that are out there for costs, um, and, how do you assess the prospect of getting to the 15 billion? Thanks, Andrea. Let, let's turn to Gita and Rushir, and then others may may wish to follow on. Gita, can we start with you? Uh, yes, uh, Andrea. So you're right. We will have an update to our forecasts very soon, in a couple of weeks. Uh, what becomes tricky to do is to separate out now the consequences for the global economy coming from the pandemic which are interacting with the costs of the Russian invasion into Ukraine. Uh, and so we, our estimates will, will include both those factors. Uh, we are heading towards a downward revision, the extent of which will be put out in, uh, in a couple of weeks. So the cost of the economy from more general disruptions and uh, the war in Ukraine is, is going to be uh, very significant. In terms of the uh, effect, uh, I think this was a point that uh, Richard made, which is taking our last forecast, which is $13.8 trillion. And since the pandemic is not over and we have uh, disruptions to the supply chain that continue and other costs, including human capital that uh, Richard mentioned, that number is only going up. But when we're talking about already at $14 trillion, that is huge compared to what needs to be paid for in terms of preventing such pandemics from happening and from, for ending the acute phase of the pandemic, which is under low billions. To your question about the number and the 15 billion number for this year, when we wrote our pandemic plan last year, the required grants were around, the required grants were 35 billion uh, and the global community did step up. And so we are now down to a residual amount of 15 billion. So I would first recognize the fact that the international community did make funding available. It's just not enough. And we need to go the extra mile and close the last gaps and also do this on a multi-year basis. Now, yes, you're right that countries are in a situation where they are being hit with multiple shocks. Their budgets are under strain. Uh, and this is part, this is another point that we're making here, which is when we make these kinds of investments, it, it's cannot, it can no longer just be about COVID-19, but uh, a systemic approach. This is what uh, Pete has mentioned. That we want a systems approach so that we are trying to help not just with COVID-19 disease, but with all the other kinds of health risks that exist. So we want complementarities. We want to amplify the effect. And again, these costs are small, very small, 
relative to the benefits of uh, preventing future uh, pandemics. Thanks very much, uh, Gita. Just looking at other panelists, if they wish to come in on this particular question. Richard, please. Sure. No, I, I, just to pick up, I mean, Gita mentioned the billion dollar estimate. It, 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 it triggered uh, thoughts of the current debates on Capitol Hill about the, the COVID supplemental budget and the fact that international funding uh, for COVID responses has, has now been removed from that, that current bill. That's, of course, disappointing. It is understandable that, that donors are seeing multiple calls on, on resources. I mean, CEPI has just completed um, its Global Pandemic Preparedness Summit, which was part of our resource mobilization effort. Peter has a resource mobilization effort underway later this year. Um, the COVAX AMC is, is seeking to secure funding. This, this is a very challenging time to secure resources. But I, I, I just to build on, on, on Gita's point, the, I, I think governments that have conceptualized these kinds of expenditures, particularly related to ending the acute phase of the pandemic in the global south, ha have often looked to their development budgets, which are quite constrained. Uh, and I, I don't think they are conceptualizing the problem in the right way because of the kinds of ongoing costs that, that Gita has underscored. And so failing to, you, you know, be Failing to find the resources to end the pandemic now when the costs are so huge is, 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 is terrible accounting within governments. And as many crises as, as we're facing, this is a crisis that, will, crisis that will continue to unfold and unspool over time if we don't put the resources against it that it requires. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, let me turn to... Sure. Oh, sorry, sure. Can uh, I Peter, just chip of in? course. Yes. Peter. Yeah, just very, I mean, just to repeat the, um, the obvious, the world is facing multiple simultaneous uh, challenges. Uh, but in this kind of situation, I think it's imperative that we focus on efficiency, uh, that we're making every dollar work as hard as we can, which is why I uh, emphasize the importance of investing in systems that deliver not just for COVID-19, but for existing diseases and for future pandemic preparedness. Um, and, and just to pick up on the point Richard made, um, the Global Fund this year is uh, having our replenishment. We replenish on a three-year cycle, uh, and we're targeting to raise $18 billion at a replenishment conference that President Biden will be hosting um, uh, later this year, which will add to the various um, uh, demands on um, the richer nations of the world. Um, but what I would also say is that it's incredibly important right now that we don't forget the, the poorest and most marginalized in the world. Because all these overlapping crises, whether it's COVID-19 or the unfinished fight against pandemics like HIV or the impact of higher energy prices and food prices as a result of the horrible war in Ukraine, they all end up piling onto and exacerbating the, the misery, the deprivation of those who are poor, marginalized, displaced populations, uh, and so on. And it's critical, I think, that we, we don't forget them as we make, as the world has to make some very, very difficult trade-offs. Over. Thank you very much for that, uh, Peter. Let me go uh, back online, and I see The Economist is with us uh, today. Natasha Loder. Natasha, would you like to come in? Yes. Hi. Thank you for taking my question. So uh, we're moving into an era of plentiful COVID vaccine supply, and I wonder if I could challenge uh, the panelists on the 70% targets for vaccine. The report talks about this. And it's not clear to me what the ongoing health or economic basis is for this. The 70% target was, must have been, I assume, but correct me if I'm wrong, set at a time when we hoped to prevent infection and reach some kind of herd immunity. And very clearly, we're in a situation where that's just not possible with the vaccines that we have to hand. 
And it's also a target which is set globally and actually isn't what many nations want or the individuals in them. Um, all that seems possible. I mean, you can only need to look at America. Um, but actually, many, many individual countries don't have that 70% um, target. And then related to that, I just would like, so I'd like you to talk about, you know, realistically, is this something we actually need to do, um, given the other health priorities as well? And then related to um, that, uh, and the fact that we are facing a glut of vaccine this year and that suppliers are starting to trim the quantities, it seems to me that the kind of most pertinent question that we're faced with now with regard to vaccines, which is one of our major tools, is how much government should um, continue to support the production of this vaccine, these vaccines this year and next year. Thanks very much, Natasha. We'll probably make this the, the last question, so I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to uh, come in on this one. It's just a question of who would like to go first uh, on, on this question of uh, vaccine targets, vaccine production, and so on. Looking to go... I'm happy to. I'm happy to, but Richard may want to come in, but I'm happy to follow Richard. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm happy, happy to jump in. I mean, I think the, the value of, of vaccination in, in reducing the, the severe morbidity and mortality of, of COVID is, is quite clear. And countries that have achieved high vaccination rates, especially in their most vulnerable populations, you know, are now entering a phase where Omicron is sweeping through, causing tremendous amounts of disease, as, as, as Jeremy pointed out in his opening remarks, uh, but, but yet being managed and systems are, are not crumbling under under the wave of disease. So a achieving high rates of vaccination is something that should be a target for every country. Achieving very high rates of vaccination in the most vulnerable populations is an absolute priority. And, and I think we're, we, Natasha, to your point, uh, we're, we're now coming back to, to conversations that are emphasizing the importance of getting vaccine to the highest, most vulnerable populations um, as, as a high priority. I think we're also, as we enter an era of plentiful vaccine supply, um, where supply constraints are no longer the problem, we're, we're also shifting towards, uh, through to at least through the COVAX mechanism and our efforts through COVAX, um, you know, to meeting countries, country-driven efforts, or, or, or to letting countries take control and, and tell us what they're trying to achieve uh, and then we're trying to provide them with the tools to meet those goals. And, and different countries will, over time, I think, define different targets and goals for themselves. And I think it is incumbent upon those of us working in the multilateral community to try to support countries in those efforts. Jeremy, I don't, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, yeah I would. And, and it, it's, relate, it's relating to the humility of two years into a pandemic, Natasha, um, and a sense of a no-regret policy. Um, a few things scientifically. Um, I think we are very clear now that a combination of vaccination on top of or not natural immunity gives you better protection, um, uh, and boosting doses gives you better protection. Vaccinations, as Richard said, prevent, remarkably prevent severe illness, hospitalizations, and deaths. They don't have zero impact on transmission. They do have some impact on transmission. And we should remember that all societies are integrated. So the vulnerable don't exist in the absence of linking to their children, their grandchildren, younger individuals as well. Because in most uh, countries, the cycle has been transmission through younger individuals, passing it on then to their parents and their, and their grandparents. And although herd immunity in the sense of vaccination and transmission stops is not something we're, we believe we're going to see now with this infection, it's not true to say that vaccination and or natural immunity doesn't have some impact on transmission. And then we've got the final bit, which is about the conversation we had earlier about long COVID. And I just want to portray a scenario, which is why this IMF paper is so, so important. Imagine a scenario where we downgraded all the manufacturing capacity, where we didn't vaccinate as many people in a population as we could, including a focus on the most vulnerable, but also on other sectors of society. And we had another wave. 
an Omicron Plus, and we had to upscale that manufacturing capacity again, that would be a three to six months delay again. So I think at this stage of the pandemic, any idea that we're going to start downgrading our manufacturing capacity at a global level, or we're going to start pulling back from offering vaccines to the majority of a population, if not 100%, or that we're going to stop vaccinating certain sectors of society, I think would be uh, a wrong decision to make. And I can imagine a scenario where in one or two years' time, we would deeply, deeply regret doing that if the rosy-tinted spectacle, which politicians are pushing very hard, that we're going to somehow live with this and it's really flu, didn't pan out to be true. So I would be cautious about shifting away from the existing targets, the 70%, the focus, yes, on the vulnerable, but appreciating that societies are integrated. And the last thing I would do at the moment is to downgrade the manufacturing capacity because we do not know when we're going to need it again in the next year or two. Thank you, Jeremy. Peter, I'm wondering, do you want to come in on this and then I'll turn to Gita? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we all recognize that vaccines have been and are our most powerful weapon in the fight against COVID-19. As the paper argues, um, we do need a more comprehensive response. Uh, the inequities in vaccine distribution have actually been exceeded by the inequities in, say, testing or the provision of oxygen. And we now have the prospect of uh, novel antivirals um, that could also have a very significant impact on mortality. And the advantages of moving from a vaccine only or very heavily vaccine um, approach to one which is kind of vaccine plus with a great with more emphasis on these other aspects of the response um, is that it it's more resilient it gives you better ability to detect variants and also more resistance but to different types of variants that might evolve the other thing that I think we will have to, and I think your question was sort of pushing towards that, um, inevitably countries are going to have to wrestle with difficult trade-offs because the priorities, the disease burdens in their countries vary enormously due to demography, due to um, the environment, due to the um, particular history of what diseases are prevalent um, in each location. And, and therefore, um, I do think that there isn't going to be uh, necessarily a universal answer as to um, what is the appropriate or optimal uh, approach because the disease burdens will be different and because the resource availability will be different. Um, but this is, this is not a sort of um, slow down, it's a more think more broadly um, about the approach and think in a longer term way about how we are fighting this disease alongside others. Thank you, uh, Peter. Let, let me turn to Gita. Uh, thank you. I, uh, no, Jeremy and, uh, and Richard and Peter already made, I think, the main points uh, as we see it, as just looking at where countries are. Natasha, you're absolutely right that over 100 countries are not on track to get to 70% vaccine coverage by the middle of this year. Uh, and this includes the, the United States, which is plateauing at 65%, but then also many other countries, including in including African nations, which are plateauing at much, much lower numbers. Uh, and we know that the Africa CDC has also called for a, you know, a halt to, the, the, to sending uh, vaccines because they are facing absorption capacity and vaccine hesitancy. So what we do see around the world is uh, pl some plateauing of, in many countries, plateauing of, of vaccination rates. Uh, and this is even in countries with very low levels of vaccination. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But I would just emphasize a couple of points that have already been made, which is one, the, it's absolutely utmost important to get very high levels of coverage of the vulnerable population and we're not there yet in many countries in the world. And this is extremely important. This is also in line with the WHO's prioritizations. So that's the one point to make. Second is just to emphasize the point Peter made, 
which is what the paper is about, which is the given not given that no single instrument in this toolkit is perfect and there are no silver bullets here, we need all pieces of it, including testing, treatment, to uh, prepare for us, prepare for future scenarios, and also to make sure that the vaccines stay fit for purpose. Because if we need to further develop the vaccine to newer variants, we would need to be able to test to make sure that we actually know and do the surveillance to make sure that, that we have our vaccines fit for purpose. And then lastly, in terms of the fact that countries have resource constraints. And so while we should certainly push for as big vaccine coverage as possible, sometimes it's going to be like pushing on a string and you're not going to get very far if there's very high levels of, of hesitancy. So we need a multi-pronged approach and, and that's what this paper is about. Thank, thank you very much, Gita. I'm going to give the last word to Rushir. Uh, perhaps just to add one point to build on everything that has been said, uh, we should also recognize the, yes, Natasha, that there, uh, demand for now for vaccines may be reaching a saturation point, but that is just a point in time assessment. We should not accept that as a reality. And in fact, I want to recognize the work of um, COVAX partners, WHO, UNICEF, Gavi. They are really stepping up their efforts in, in working on the demand management and engaging countries, helping them with flexible financing on vaccine deliveries. And so we are already seeing some of that efforts paying off. And, and from a systemic risk perspective, it's also important, yes, to take into account, as you said very rightly, the national goals, but also bring that global perspective into uh, because of the spillover risk. So having more high level engagement with countries where the vaccination coverage is plotting off at very low levels uh, will have high returns. Uh, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Rashir, and thanks to all our panelists today. And thanks to all of you uh, out there in uh, the media for joining us today. I think this was a very important discussion, and I think the engagement of uh, media is a testament to that. So thanks again for joining us at the IMF, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Stay safe, and see you all again. Bye-bye.